Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari and this is Great Big History Podcast. In this episode, we talk about the Hebrews, defeat, trauma, and survival. The Hebrews had early success. They cleared out Canaanite tribes. They claimed the land, the promised land. David, who is a warlord, overthrows Saul, the first king, and creates a kingdom somewhere around 1050 BCE. He unites the tribes, defeats the Philistine enemy. You have an example of that with the Goliath story. He allies with Phoenicians, who were the merchants to the north that give him some access to Mesopotamian and Egyptian goods. So what we have from Exodus through David and then is success. Military, political, economic success. There are small people in a small land, but they have carved it out. They have survived the Bronze Age collapse and they, under David, are thriving. He will build Jerusalem. He'll take what was a hilltop fort and turn it into a Mesopotamian city. A city that is, um, shows that the Hebrews were a serious people. Remember, we've talked about this, right? There is Babylon out there, right? Babylon is 1500 years old by the time Jerusalem as a major city is built under David. And So you have the Sumerian cities, you have Ur and Uruk, you have Babylon, right? And if you're a Mesopotamian people and you want to show you're serious, you need to have a city, a real city. The Phoenicians have them. Babylon exists. Remember, people who don't have cities, the Assyrians, the Persians, will build capital cities to show that they are serious. It is a sign of legitimacy as a civilization. You need to have a major city, and David builds it. It's not complete, but he builds one. And so the Hebrews are our smallest people that we've talked about so far, but they get to sit at the big boys' table. They have a real city. They have military success. Solomon continues that success. He will add to Jerusalem by building the temple. It will be a massive temple structure. It takes up 30% of the area within the walls. It shows that religion is the most important part of this culture. It has the Holy of Holies, which is Yahweh's hotel on earth it has thousands of priests which make it an economic engine people will do sacrifices there people will travel there people will be tourists there people will do um festivals there the priests themselves need paper and ink and clothes and food and so it's this economic engine creating the economy of jerusalem it's a significant building it shows that the hebrews can build big stuff. It is a building also of education and writing of trying to understand Yahweh and what Yahweh wants. It shows that the Hebrews may be small, but have an impressive cultural power. They may be strange to the polytheists around them, They act strange. They do different things. They don't eat what other people eat. They circumcise. But they are an impressive cultural power under Solomon. The Queen of Sheba is, in a story, comes up to visit, comes up to make a trade deal and to hang out for a year with Solomon. And she's coming from Africa or Yemen, the end of Arabia. But she's coming a long distance. To have a trade connection with Solomon. So Israel, the kingdom of Israel, not the modern state of Israel, the kingdom of Israel is a respectable middle-ranked power. 
with a legitimate mid tier, um, with legitimate mid tier power in a Babylonian Egyptian world, right? They're not. They can't defeat Babylon, and they can't defeat Egypt in a war. They're not a major power. They're not a great power, but they are a respectable middle ranked power in a world of two colossi. Trade, culture, connections. That's the Queen of Sheba story. All show this influence. So it's kind of sad. I don't know what other word to say because what happens next over the next several hundred years is a disaster. A continuous, slow disaster from this pinnacle. After Solomon's death, there are weaker kings and the kingdom eventually splits. It cracks into Israel in the north and Judah in the south. Israel, the kingdom of Israel, is the richer, more urbanized, more populous, more sophisticated, more Mesopotamian part. It's connected to Phoenicia. It's got major trade routes that go through it. It has its own few but small ports. It's the cool cousin. Many of you are either the cool cousin or have a really cool older cousin. Israel is that cool cousin. In every way, it's richer, it's urbanized, it's populous, it's, in, it's educated, it's sophisticated. And it's also more Mesopotamian, which also means it's a little polycurious. It hangs out with other peoples. It hangs out with other gods. It does things like animal sacrifice, maybe even a little child sacrifice, but very, very little. We don't really want to talk about it, but they do things. They put up little, not temples, but little structures for other gods. And they kind of, you know, hey, put some bacon on the pizza. It's okay. It's okay. No one's, no one's checking. They, they are the cool cousin hanging out with the cool Babylonian kids. In the high school that is Mesopotamia. Judah is the opposite of all the things. It is poorer. It is more rural. It is less populated. It has less cities. It is less sophisticated. It is less educated. It is less Mesopotamian. It's more Hebrew. It's more Canaanite. A large part of it is desert. which will be where some prophets come from. But it has Jerusalem. It has the capital city. It has the religion. It has the priests. So Judah, the southern kingdom, is much more traditional, much more religious, much more conservative, much more homogeneous. It is the cousin that stays home on Friday and Saturday nights. And you may have this. Have you ever had your mom come to you and say, look, look, you're going to this party. I know you're going to the party. Can you bring your cousin? Can you call him up? Bring him. It's, it's good if they get out. Can you, can you take him with you? Make sure they don't get into any trouble. But, and you're like, oh, mom, come on. Really? All right. Doot, 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 doot. Hey, cuz. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, there's a party. Do you want to go? It's All the cool people are going to be there. Oh, I don't know. I was planning on alphabetizing my shampoos. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, look. Why don't you just come... Put on some blue jeans or something. Oh, I, okay. I, I don't know. Is there going to be drinking there? No, I, I, well, you don't have to drink. I don't, you, to, 
Well, I don't know. But, um, yeah. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Stay home then. It's it's cool. It's cool. We'll I'll get you next time. Okay. And that's the relationship. And this is fine. As long as neither state gets involved in anyone else's wars. As long as no one, as long as Israel doesn't get sucked into Mesopotamian politics and Judah doesn't like try to absorb Israel. I don't, I don't know what Judah would try to do. It, it just kind of like goes, oh, my cousin, you know, I don't know. Goes all those parties out past 9 p.m. Maybe something bad will happen. And that's, you know. Well, in 725, Israel joins Babylon against Assyria. And it is a disaster. The Assyrians were making noise. The Assyrians were doing things. The Assyrians were starting to conquer their, their empire with their professional army with their militarized society. And Babylon, obviously, as the big kid on the block, was like, oh, we're not going to take this. And they were going to throw a party. And they called up Israel and said, Israel, you want to come to this party? We're going to you know, throw a party for Assyria. And then we're going to jump them and beat the snot out of them. And Israel's like, cool. Yeah, that sounds like fun. Right? Everybody's going to be there, right? Oh, yeah, everybody's going to be there. All right. Well, then they show up. And Assyria, rather than being the weak kid, you can, you can, you know, the kid who talks tough, but is actually weak, actually turns out to be like Neo from the Matrix and beats up everybody and then goes looking for revenge. As everyone runs away, Assyria is like, I know who you are and I'm coming to your house. And they did. And in 725, they invade Israel, the kingdom of Israel, and crush it. They obliterate it. They, they like use a, a broom and just wipe it away. And you could see it in the archaeology. In the archaeology, it goes from a vibrant Hebrew culture, Canaanite culture, Mesopotamian, Canaanite Hebrew culture, to like the moon. It's gone. It is defeat, invasion, and genocide. This is known as the 10 lost tribes. There were the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 sons of Israel. It's something about 80%, 85% of the population. Gone. Depopulated. Assimilated. They got picked up and moved. The Romans will do this in 70 AD. We'll do this again. This happens to Israel, the Hebrews, twice. This is what one does in the ancient world. Why? They cause a rebellion. They're, bad, they're, they're your enemies. So what do you do? You pick them up and you scatter them. Why? Because what happens? Well, you're some dude living in now a town in Armenia, in the middle of nowhere. You're now one Hebrew dude, or maybe a small Hebrew family living in, he living in a small town in a Syrian-controlled Armenia. You are a thousand miles away from where your homeland was. Nobody speaks your language. So what language do you have to start speaking? You speak what the Assyrians speak. Right? Or you speak what the Armenians are speaking, right? And you're, you got to get married. You're a young man. You got to have kids, right? You got you to gotta have a future. So who are you going to marry? You're going to marry an Armenian girl. All right. Then you're going to have kids. So those kids are half Armenian, half Hebrew, half native, right? Half Assyrian. You're going to marry an Assyrian girl, right? You probably aren't going to be that lucky. So you're going to marry some colonial person, right? Who's not Hebrew, all right? So now your kids are 50-50, right? But they're living in this colonial world that's not the Hebrew world. So when they go to school, what school are they going to? They're going to a native school. Who are their friends going to be? They're all going to be locals, native locals. What language are they going to speak? They're going to speak the native language. Who are they going to want to marry? A native girl. And then their kids are going to be three quarters native. And what? And everybody wants to be cool. So how are they going to behave? What food are they going to eat? What tales are they going to tell? What sports are they going to play? The local sports. And suddenly you go from 
a regular Hebrew citizen living in a Hebrew world, speaking Hebrew, living by Hebrew laws, eating Hebrew food to the moon. And you're weird, right? Because you're now the only person in the area behaving this way, trying to keep up the old ways. Even your kids are like, granddad, you're a little weird. What's this with the what's this with the uh, the blood on the door thing? That's just guys, guy I know, I know, I know you're you're freaked out by it, but this is one time a year. Granddad does some weird stuff. I don't I don't understand it either. He he says it has to do with the god of a place that I've never even heard of. I don't even know where it is. Is it on a map? It's near Egypt. Okay. I guess. He had something bad happen. He's just let's go get let's go get ice cream, right? And that's what happens: assimilation, and so your culture disappears. And that's what happened to the ten tribes. They're gone. There is no record of them. They are disappeared. Why does this matter? Because Assyria, in their two wars with the Hebrews, the one in seven twenty five, and then the one where they lay siege to Jerusalem in seven oh seven came way closer to wiping out Hebrew culture than Hitler could have possibly have imagined, than the Holocaust, for all its destruction, for all its attempt, for all its science, for all its industry, for all the energy that the Nazis put into murdering these people, of hunting them down. Even they, in their feverish, most evil of dreams, could not have dreamed of doing what the Assyrians actually accomplished or what the Assyrians came super close to accomplishing and could have done. That's how much of a trauma this is to Judah, their older cousin, their cool cousin their more populated cousin, their more uh, sophisticated cousin, their richer cousin is gone, obliterated, uh, uh, destroyed. There's nothing left of them. How could Yahweh allow this? Well, you saw it in Jeremiah in the previous lecture. And then in 707, Assyria lays siege to Jerusalem. They roll in, lay siege to Jerusalem. Sennacherib, conqueror of Babylon, lay siege to Jerusalem. He could have, without any trouble, battered down those walls. If he wanted to. There's some historians who are like, oh, well, the Bible says, oh, a giant plague wiped out 90% of the army. Or there's the historians who try to take that and add it to, you know, history and say, well, there's not enough water and maybe in their siege they would have poisoned the wells or the Assyrians just broke into Babylon. They can break into Jerusalem. The Assyrians lay siege and they took what they wanted. If Sennacherib wanted to burst into Jerusalem and murder everybody. He could have. And so what happens? He lays siege to Jerusalem in 707 and basically says, were you part of this? Were you with Babylon? No. Because if you were with Babylon and you, you saw what we did to your cousin, we will destroy you too. We weren't there. Well, if you weren't there, we're going to punish you anyway. You're going to have to pay us money. Okay. Well, you know, if you pay us money, we're insulting you and humiliating you, and you should just fight us back, right? And uh, when you fight us back, we'll just destroy you. I know, but we won't fight. We'll give you the money. We'll find it. But, um, but we really want to destroy your city. Uh, just give us a reason to destroy your city. Uh, couldn't you like like Babylon like a lot? No, we don't like.
like them very much. They, they're too big and sophisticated. And don't, they have too many languages. No, 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 no. And so Sennacherib says, you're going to pay us X amount of money for X amount of years, which is basically forever, and we won't destroy you. And Judah says, okay. And that was the smartest thing to do. Why? Because this was a near death of an entire culture. It's a huge trauma. How did Yahweh allow this to happen? And then how did Yahweh allow the siege of 707 to happen? Is Yahweh trying to destroy us? They wiped out our cousins. What are they? What is Yahweh trying to do? And the answer they come up with, the prophets of Judea come up with is, Israel wasn't Hebrew enough. It's slut shaming. They deserved it. They hung out with Babylon. They hung out with naughty gods. They ate pig. They didn't keep to the laws. It is slut shaming. It's saying Israel deserved it. So what response do you get in Judah? Religious conservatism. A literal view of the law. If the law says you go to bed at 7.56 p.m., you go to bed at 7.56 p.m. You don't go to bed later at 8.20 or 9.30 or 1.02 in the morning. No, that would be breaking the law. But you also... Don't go to bed at 7.02. You don't go to bed earlier because that's saying you're better than the law. You're better than God. You know more than God. And Yahweh gets mad at that too. And I understand that as a professor. I am totally with that on Yahweh. I have essay tests. And I say, do one of the essays. And what do I have students do? They write all three essays. They have a choice of three. I say, do one of the three. They write all three. And they're like, we'll pick the best one. No, I don't want to pick the best one. First of all, if you wrote three essays in the same time, everyone else wrote one essay, there's no way your three essays are anywhere close to as good. So there is no best one. The second thing is, I asked you to do a thing. And you said, I'm going to be a better student. I'm going to do more than that thing. And that's as annoying as if you didn't do the thing in the first place. I can deal with the you didn't do the first thing in the first place. You know you broke the rules. I know you broke the rules. There's a punishment for breaking the rules. We're cool with that. It's when you think you're superior to when you're doing a bitter job, a bigger job, you're when you're superior to what I'm asking for, that now we have to have a conflict. So I'm down with Yahweh being like, I said 756. Go to bed at 756. And they do. Because the prophets win. The prophets say, we follow the laws. Yahweh will be happy. So we're going to be super Hebrews. We are going to follow these laws to the letter. And so monotheism wins. Monolatry is out. Polytheism is gone. Like you want to play around with Babylonian gods? Not in Judea. Not in Judah. Conservatism wins. Don't change. Don't mix. Stay out of politics. Don't get involved with Egypt. Don't get involved with Babylon. Don't get involved with Assyria. Stay out of it. And that conservatism, that fear, that trauma, that religiosity, that's going to be the armor. If we just follow Moses' rules, we'll be safe. That blanket means nothing bad should ever happen again. Judah should exist as a small conservative state within a larger empire, Assyria or whoever will replace Assyria. It doesn't matter to the Judeans. They should be fine because they should survive and thrive by keeping to itself and not changing. Well, guess what happens? That works for a little while until 585, the disaster, the catastrophe. Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar rolls in and obliterates Jerusalem. Why? Because Judah was on its way to Egypt and Babylon was in a war with Egypt. This is after, remember, the Assyrian Empire broke up in 612, right? The Medes, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, and the Lydians are all fighting each other. 
we're still a few way, years, we're still a few decades away from the Persians. The Persians are still the Medes' little cousins. Nobody cares about them. And Babylon rolls in and destroys Jerusalem, breaks in the walls, carts off thousands into slavery in Babylon, obliterates the temple. This is a humiliation for the super God. Why? Because the Holy of Holies is in that temple. It is God's place on earth. And the polytheistic Babylonians are destroying it, are taking the books out of it, are lighting it on fire. The Babylonians rip up this culture by its roots. It looks like what Assyria did to Israel, part two. It looks like what Assyria threatened to do to Judah in 707 actually happening. This is a disaster. Because there is no other Hebrew kingdom to save Hebrew culture. And so again, this is a trauma. This is the second trauma for Judah. Well, Judah's gone, but the Hebrews are left. And they ask the question, how could this happen? We followed the rules and Yahweh didn't protect us. And so a natural answer for a lot of people is Yahweh is weak. The Babylonian gods are obviously stronger. The Assyrian gods were stronger. The Babylonian gods were stronger. Obviously, this God, Yahweh, can't protect us. Because remember what rule number one is of polytheism. It is protection. It's protection from nature. It's protection from neighbors. Gods protect you. And Yahweh ain't doing that. So lots of people became Babylonian. Because it made sense. You made money. You married into Babylonian peoples. You got a business. You assimilated. You became. You went from loser to winner. You got to join the winning team. Just by throw. Just by changing your gods, it wasn't that hard. The the Israelites did it. They became Assyrian. They became Armenian. They became colonial people within the Assyrian Empire. They're gone. They're no longer Hebrews. But for a hundred years, they were winners. Until Assyria was destroyed. But, but, but there are people who are like, no, no, no. And this is maybe a rump. It's maybe 10%. It may be 25%. But there's still people who are like, no, 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 no. We are Yahweh's chosen people. And Yahweh is the true super God. And we were following the rules. This is the thing that hurts. We were following the rules. So the answer they come up with is it is test of faith. Only true believers get to be Yahweh's chosen people. Only true believers get to be, get the blessings of Yahweh. A weak faith is no faith. If Yahweh is going to be the super God of a chosen people, does he want a chosen people who only want to win? Who only believe when the things are good? That's not faith. That's 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 not love. That's you're being bribed. That's a bribe. Oh, you're giving me something good? You're giving me a good life? Yeah, why? Thank you. I guess I'll follow you. That's fine. That's not faith. Abraham had to believe in Yahweh even when Abraham got nothing out of it. Moses the same had to believe in it when there was no evidence that what was promised was going to happen. Real faith is believing of in loving when the evidence tells you you shouldn't. It is hold the line. It is trust the process. It is believe what you can not see. It is a test of faith. And that is hard. So most Hebrews don't pass that test. Most Hebrews that go into slavery in Babylon don't pass that test. They become Babylonian because that was easier. It was more financially available. It was the smarter decision. For the individual. But do the Hebrews that are left pass the test? Yes. 
And that's when Cyrus shows up in 538. Cyrus shows up, conquers Babylon. He's defeated his father and ab absorbed the Medes and assimilated the Medes and the Persians. He's then marched up and after being attacked by the Lydians, defeated the Lyd Lydians and absorbed the Lydians and the Greeks. He has then turned around, come over the Tarsus Mountains, come down the rivers of Mesopotamia, come to Babylon, which surrendered to him. And then entering Babylon, sat on a giant throne and said, holy crackers, there's a lot of weird people here. Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? And who are you? Oh, we're Judea. We're, we're the Hebrew people from Cana of the land that used to once be called Judea. Uh, how about I call you Judeans and Jews for short? And they said, that's great. Because by calling us Judeans, short into Jews, it meant we were the rightful owners of Judea, what the Babylons destroyed and that other colonialists had settled on, Phoenicians and, and um, various other peoples had settled on. And, you know, Cyrus is saying, we'll give you your land back. I will send you back because you are slaves in, in Babylon and I will send you back. And they go, great. Um, but, um, Mr. Cyrus, sir, uh, we, we, we had a, a city. Great. Was it an awesome city? Well, it's not Babylon, but it was pretty good for our standards. I will help you rebuild it. Was there anything imported in that city? Oh, yes, yes, yes. There was a temple. There was a temple? Yes, to our one God. You are one God? Um, You fought the Babylonians and you only had one God? Uh, they have like 12. You had one God? Well, he's, he's, well, he's really powerful. Uh, I can see because you're a slave. Okay. So you one God, one temple. Well, okay. Look, you want to have your one God in your one temple? That's fine. Was it a big temple? Oh, yes, because we only had the one. We put all our money into it. Uh, so can you help us rebuild it? I will help you rebuild it. Yes. I will help you. And, and hearing all of this, a bunch of people came back and go, we're Judeans too. And they went, uh, he looked at them and said, um, well, are you sure? Cause you're dressed like Babylonians who I just defeated. You're eating, uh, bacon on a stick, which can you Judeans do that? No, you, you're not supposed to, you're not supposed to do that. Fried pork chop. Uh, no. And uh, you said it to me in Babylonian. I mean, at least they originally spoke the Judean language. What, Hebrew? 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 They told they spoke it in Hebrew. I don't understand. I'm Persian. Like I'm not from around here. You people are weird. All of you are weird, and you look like Babylonians. And so you don't get to whole go home. You get nothing. You get you lose. You lose, sir. Good day. And they go, oh, okay. So he sends the Judeans who become known as the Jews back to Jerusalem, which is a claim that they get Judah, they get Judea, they get Jerusalem, they get to rebuild their temple. They passed the test. And it shows that you have to stay true even in bad times. And that, that, that is exclamation point like five, because that will allow the Hebrews to survive. Even though, even when absolute destruction happens. Rome, the diaspora, the pogroms, the Holocaust. It allows for the legitimacy and survival. It changes the Hebrews into Jews. This process, the Babylonian captivity through the return of Cyrus, who Remember, Isaiah called a Messiah for this, right? He saved the Hebrew people. And 
This allows a civilization to survive even when others don't, right? Ancient Rome is gone, right? The ancient Greeks are gone, right? The Mes Macedonians, as they were, are gone. All of these ancient peoples are gone. They've all been mixed around. They've all been changed, right? And the Hebrews are not pure. They've changed too. Because they've had to. But their culture has survived. On this continuity, it has had to be flexible in its belief, but it incorporated its trauma into its culture to maintain that legitimacy and that survival. So that when, even when all the evidence says you should disappear, you should be assimilated, you should go. They don't. They suffer. The culture suffers. Poverty. Disenfranchisement. Persecution. Violence. Genocide. And it survives. The Carthaginians are gone. The Judeans, the Hebrews survived, even though Rome did more or less the same thing to both cultures. The Hebrews were in diaspora for 2,000 years. 2,000. Yeah. You know, nine, yeah. Almost 2,000 years. In 1900, there was about 5% of the population in what was then called Palestine was Jewish. There were more Christians in Palestine and had been for hundreds of years. A dispossessed people, dispossessed of their home in a foreign land, submerged in a foreign culture, survives. Why? Because of this. Because of this change that you didn't have to be tied to the place. You didn't have to be tied to the temple. It, it's nice and it would help and it's good and it should be. But that the culture was more important. And the civilization survives because it's a test of faith. And other cultures don't. And that's where we will end. Thank you.